Hey, I'm Dr. Gwen. Did you know that the understanding of executive functioning has evolved beyond goal setting, planning, and completing homework? Well, in today's episode, I welcome back Dr. Deborah Budding and Dr. Laura Flores Shaw to talk about a chapter that they wrote in a book that helps us understand executive functioning from this more evolved lens. Welcome to the show. I am so excited to welcome back Dr. Deborah Budding and Dr. Laura Flores Shaw. Hi, ladies. Hello. 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 Um, you both wonderful ladies are here to talk about your new chapter in the book, Pediatric Neuropsychology Within the Multidisciplinary Context. All right, Deb, talk, tell us about this chapter. Um, well, first, I will say if anybody's looking to like find the book, um, it is published out of the UK. And so um, pediatric is spelled in that uh, style with A-E, pediatric. So it will not be found without the A. That's I can link it too. I'll, I'll, I'll put a link in the description. Okay. Okay. Um, so it, it is a, it's a textbook. So, which means it is bludgeoning weapon size, um, and has many chapters focusing on different things um, that are considered to be useful for pediatric assessment and also in a multidisciplinary way. So as opposed to um, simply talking theory, each chapter, which is focusing on different areas of function that neuropsychologists are taught to consider, um, is including a case study so that it has a, an application component. And um, uh, Laura and I wrote a chapter on executive function. Um, and the specific focus for us was on um, expanding the view of executive function to include um, the environment because a lot of times um, Neuropsychologists, and, and I just think most clinical and educational folks are really taught to focus on the individual person as opposed to um, the relationship between a person and their environment, whether their environment is the built environment or other people or culture. Um, and so we felt it was important to bring that perspective in. So that was the, the focus of our chapter that is simply called executive function. Laura, do you want to add to that? Well, yeah, to bring the, the environment in, but also to bring up um, what we call bottom-up processes yeah. you know, in as well, because so meaning um, processes that don't originate in the, in the cortex of the brain, because we tend to be very corticocentric in our approach to things. And so it's always kind of viewed from the perspective that the, the, you know, the, the frontal lobe, particularly the prefrontal cortex is essentially telling the rest of the brain what to do and controlling it and so on and so right. forth as if I you mean, have what, like a little man in your head. That's what something. makes it the top of the food chain, you know, human supremacy, et cetera. Yeah. It's the human, it's part of the human yeah. exceptionalism narrative. Yeah. So sure. we very much reject that viewpoint. Um, and so the, the, the purpose for us doing this particular chapter was to bring in um, uh, particularly like work like Paul Chizik's work that looks at the dynamic interaction with the environment that, that we all must do if, if we are to survive. Um, and also that executive function is typically considered kind of top-down, cognitively driven, and arousal and emotional function tends to be left out as an area of executive function. And so when we talk about top-down versus bottom-up, it really is more about deliberate and more automatic processes, and which in itself is a, is a bit of a simplistic division, but you got to start somewhere in terms of explaining things. And so sometimes we need to start very simply and then expand upon it. So 
that's sort of how we approached it and then looked at the literature basically and discussed a case uh, and focused on executive function issues within the case um, but then broadened what that means and importantly uh, the, the chapter includes an academic piece so it's looking it's looking at a child within the context of family and in the context of an educational setting, which in this case was a Montessori setting, which is also important. Yeah. You know, um, kind of going back to the simplicity um, and what frameworks offer, which is, t uh, in my mind, it's to drive understanding. Mm -hmm. Supposedly. Um, right? It's, it's to drive understanding of something. Um, before we get too far, um, just because I want to make sure the audience understands, um, the word multidisciplinary disciplinary. What exactly does that mean? Like who is, who is this book then good for if it's a multidisciplinary kind of like we're looking at something through a multidisciplinary context? Laura, do you want to take this one or do you want me to? Well, I, I would have you take that one because this is, this is, uh, I mean, it's a book. Well, it for is a pediatric, pediatric neuropsychology book. All right. So, yes. so, so when, when, when a, Neuropsychologist uses multidisciplinary. What we're talking about is a team of people from different areas of training that come together to work together collaboratively with an individual and family to assist with whatever clinical concerns are, are bringing them to, to seek assistance. So speech and language, occupational therapy, play therapy, music therapy. Um, as you know, I am not a fan of ABA, so we did not include that as one of our interventions. Um, but it's, it's, so it's, it's a wide variety of, of people with different kinds of training and different areas of expertise um, working together as, as a team, as opposed to being siloed and, and working individually and separately. Yeah, and I think that a lot of the audience can relate to this because even if we think about an IEP team, Yes. Right, an educational IEP team where we have a teacher, uh, maybe an OT, maybe a speech therapist, maybe a PT, uh, adaptive PE. We might have augmentative communication. We might have orientation and mobility. Like all of these people coming together really um, for this one person, right? Yeah. To, to, to support this one person. And then the I think providing evidence um, or science backed um, it's a really a science backed or evidence based way to think about executive functioning in this more um, contextual way. And so you guys were saying top down means like, um, you know, thinking first. Right. Thoughts I mean, first, yes. right? Cognitively driven planning, thinking ahead. You know, it's, it's very much driven by that old fashioned serial processing view of of cognition where we perceive things and then we think about things, don't barf Laura, and then we act. Okay. Yeah, right. And then and you're dead, obviously. Right. Because... That's a very traditional way though, right, Deb? Yes. I mean, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, when you hear, when I hear about executive functioning um, today, today, I mean, like it just yesterday, um, I had this conversation with someone. I know. Um, it, executive functioning is typically, or I think has been seen more colloquially anyway, as goal planning mm -hmm. or goal setting, uh, creating a plan and then executing that plan. That's traditionally what I think um, executive functioning has been, uh, is used for. And I think Laura, you had mentioned earlier um, offline, off camera, that it's like homework. Yeah, Doing well, homework, that's how you get homework. your homework yeah. done. That's how you get your homework done, right? right. But then well, that, yeah. that what that turns into is also like think better, right? So that also places all of the onus on the individual and then nothing in the system or in the environment needs to change. But if the, if the individual would just think better and just plan better then everything will work out. Right, which in and of itself is an incredibly ableist point of view and does right. not consider neurodiversity and neurodivergent individuals at all 
and is basically, you know, how do we how do we make this person conform to current normative views of what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to do it by golly. Right. Yeah. And if you have all of those team members, uh, including maybe a parent or a teacher or an OT, a speech, I mean, whoever it is, if yes. the view of executive functioning was only top down, which right. really the reason why I think both of you contributed this chapter is to um, disrupt this thinking, if you will, um, which is if it's only yeah. top down, then I can imagine that if you are neurodivergent, if the um, if heaven forbid you have any sensory kinds of problems or the environment itself is not conducive to the way in which you learn, that the only thing left is to blame the learner. Right. And to use coercion coercion exactly. or even like shame maybe shame mm -hmm. shame would come in oh, here sure. coercion um and what's the learner left with uh, uh, i mean not much yeah and i think there's harm that's done there actually I, i'll go that i'll even go one step further i agree i agree which is one of Definitely. the reasons why we decided to write what we did because um it doesn't to me all of the mindfulness training in the world, all of the meditation, all of the conflict resolution techniques you learn are going out the window when you're in a fight flight state because you cannot access those things. And if you aren't including arousal and uh, sensitivity to unexpected novelty, um, those kinds of things, then you're not allowing for the whole person in relation to the environment. Because then if the environment is including people, um, the people engaging with that child also have neurologies and sensitivities and levels of arousal and um, ways of being that are going to come into play in that interactive setting and that it's always interactive. But and also it doesn't empower the individual, right? No. So if there's a, if it's a, if it's a very narrow focus on, um, and it's just, it's focused on thinking, it doesn't help the individual to consider, well, how might I actually adjust my own environment to help me in some mm -hmm. way? Right. Mm -hmm. Or be able to inform others. Actually, what I need in this environment right now is X, Y, Z. Right. Right. So it, it, it doesn't empower them. Um, and it's, uh, again, it's just very narrow, right? So it's only focused that, that one focus can lead to kind of a dead end and also, a, a situation of, uh, shame feeling less than, um, f feeling like they don't belong. Uh, all kinds of things. So that's why we need to broaden the focus. And we're not saying thinking is bad or that we shouldn't consider things like goal planning, but there's so much more that needs to be taken into consideration. Exactly. Uh, we're dealing with whole people, not, you know, we're not just dealing with a cortex. We're dealing with a brain in a body situated in an environment. Mm -hmm. So- exactly how do we deal with all of those things when thinking about executive function and not just thinking about executive function in terms of compliance, or this is how you get the kids to do their homework and that kind of thing. So then we're judging people's executive functions. This child has good executive functions. This child has bad executive functions. Well, maybe the other child who's demonstrating quote unquote, bad executive functions, maybe those are just the, those are, they're not bad. Those are the um, behaviors that are necessary for their survival in their context, because maybe their neighborhood has a lot of violence, you know? Uh, so we just, we have to take these things sort of into consideration, but it turns into a very binary, good, bad, top only, <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, and, and, and a view. lot of very kind of colonialist assumptions about what's normal. Yeah. And um, with, uh, I think uh, an ongoing lack of respect for neurodivergent people and feelings and experiences, 
and instead sort of take this very um, behaviorally oriented, do this, do that, do this or get punished or do that or, you know, don't get your reward. And it's, it is, you know, if your goal is compliance, one, I don't want to work with you, but two, you know, you're, it's just not, even if you achieve that goal at what cost to a person's, you know, being, being able to go on being who they are and to feel supported in being who they are. Um, one of the things we talk about a little bit in the chapter is kind of, kind of the double empathy problem. We don't really use that terminology, but we talk about viewing miscommunications between students as a, a two-way street, at least, and not this neurodivergent child is misbehaving. We must, we must teach him or her how to interact properly <laughs> with their peers <laughs> instead, yeah. of, instead of having it be how, how do these people misunderstand each other and how do we help them understand each other better? Yeah. And when, when we add the bottom up, we add the context, right? The onus of responsibility for a learner then, then is on everybody. Hello? Hello. That's involved. Exactly. Oh, I need to sign anything. Right? Uh, I can just say your name real fast. Yeah, uh, Deborah Buddy. Deborah? No. Sorry, had a delivery. That's okay. I'll edit that part out. Can you say out. that again, Gwen? Okay. Yeah. So when we add bottom up processing and the context to this equation, the onus of the responsibility for the learner, for the person that's being supported is now on everybody. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes. That's right. And this is a society. Right. Right. And it's, and like that's the, the thing that we're, we're so focused on interventions and changing the individual. <laughs> Like it's the person that has to change and conform. It's very oppressive. So it's, it's odd. Like in our minds, we think that we're trying to help that the intervention is really trying to help this person flourish, but it's actually very oppressive because it's not considering the whole person. It's not considering the whole person in context. It's not considering that maybe we have an environment or processes in place in an environment that are just not helpful <laughs> Mm -hmm. to this person right. and that there are other things that could be done. This, you know, this brings me to two terms then, right? If we, if we're going to broaden our understanding, if we're going to broaden the framework work of executive functioning and how really this idea is woven into really every single minute, second of someone's functioning, because that's how we're evaluating it. The, the two terms that, that come up usually are someone being scaffolded mm -hmm. and a co and co-regulated. Those so, are popular terms. Those are, so let's, let's, because right. If, if now everyone's responsible, okay. Um, then we, we do need to think about these other pieces and really define those. So let's start with scaffolding. Um, what does scaffolding mean? I read this all the time, but what is exactly, what does it mean exactly? Well, you know, part of it, well, scaffolding is like pornography. I guess you know it when you see it. Um, but when I think of scaffolding, I literally think of scaffolding around buildings, right? What do we do to help a building stay up while we're building it? And that can take the form of varying kinds of structures, of varying kinds of verbal supports, um, so it's very, to me, it's context dependent and situation dependent. And, um, <laughs> there's this amazing thing you can do sometimes is, you know, you can ask somebody what they would like. And if they know, they usually tell you, um, and if they don't, it's something that, that, that can be discussed to help figure out instead of just making an assumption that, you know, because you are the, you know, expert you you know what to do for somebody like that <laughs> and and that's how we are all were trained right so it's so again one of the goals for for us in this chapter was hoping for people in training to start thinking more systemically more um 
holistically, if you will, um, while they're training, as opposed to having to unlearn habits that have become well ingrained. Because one of the things that, that both Laura and I are very interested in are, is habit formation. And, um, and Laura actually just finished a really fantastic chapter on habits in the academic environment that when it's published, everybody will need to read. Um, but, but habit formation is very central to adaptation and doesn't tend to get considered enough. Oh, it's, it's practically ignored. Yeah. <laughs> it's ignored in, in educational environments. <clears throat> and it's just sort of assumed that actually, if you just change people's beliefs and give them knowledge, that their behavior will just change. And, right. and that's not how human behavior actually works. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that has been my biggest complaint with insight-oriented therapy, especially, especially as it's applied to the neurodiverse community, which is you don't just go drive insight and expect the insight to lead to behavior change. You actually need to support the change well, a well, little bit and, by little and there's, bit. And there's the sensory motor mm -hmm. view that, and, and I'm, you know, and Laura too, we're sensory motor driven people thinking about things. And so um, that brains are situated within bodies and bodies are situated within environments. And much of what we do to engage with the environment, we learn to do automatically without thinking about it. And we must, because if you did everything deliberately, you wouldn't make it through a day. Mm-hmm. And if you right. did, you'd be very tired. Right. Right. Which is actually what a lot of neurodivergent um, individuals experience because yes. so much is volitional. So much does need this very manual, volitional, intentional control to survive or to do things in certain environments that it burns them out. So, well, you yeah. know, yeah. yeah. So that's a piece. So scaffolding really quick, just going back to that, which is that building wouldn't be able to be built if the scaffolding wasn't there. And that scaffolding is there only when needed and only and is a away, little bit higher. It's, it's always just a thing. tiny bit higher than like where we are. It's not so high and so over the top of the building. It's really just where we need to be, right? Like we're really following the building of this structure, pacing it, and really um, meeting it where it is, but exactly. that that building can't go higher without that. Exactly. Right, that idea. Right, but at the same time, like like Deb was saying, we need to be able to build scaffolding and then, and and that also we can pull away, right? That we remove at some yeah. point and then the building doesn't collapse, Yeah. right? So there's, it's, it's not, um, you know, it's not about, creating new dependencies in some way. It's really, you know, how do we, because if we want the individual to be able to stand on their own, right? So it's about how do we help them with that? How do we help them? How do we help them understand how, their own neurology and right. understand um, their, their, um, their own behaviors, their habit formation, some of these, like, how do we, so how can we help them? So they can then develop cognitive tools Right. But it, they're not dependent on the person who's building the scaffolding for <laughs> for the rest of their life type of thing. And sometimes they are. Sense. I mean, disability is a thing. Right. Well, so, that, well, right. Right. But 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 to me, one of the one of the things that gets lost sometimes, I think, is the idea of presuming competence and y yes, um, and respecting the input from the person that we're allegedly helping. Yeah. And when you come from more of a sensory motor perspective, you tend not to blow off people saying it's too bright, it's too loud, it's too much. Yeah. Please right? stop. I don't want to. Right. No. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and How about so some it's of those? very important, right? Because I, I still run into people who are like, you're being oversensitive or just shake it off, right? And no, you know, 
Yeah. And, and that's so, the, we don't, we don't know what it's like to experience the world in somebody else's body. What we know of the world in our experience is in our body with our neurology. Right. So that's why we, we have to listen to other people and presuming competence also means that they don't need to experience the world or convey behavior that suggests that they're experiencing the world the same way that I am in order to presume competence. Right. No, mm -hmm. that's it, it's, they can look very different and act very differently and express very different things. And, you know, and there's room for it. That's I mean, all, one of, one of exactly, the things, you know, one of the things, the many things I adore about Nick Walker's work is her use of the term neurocosmopolitanism, which really is about embracing, um, neurodiversity as true diversity that, that encompasses everything and every neurology and isn't so quick to um, pathologize neurodivergent people on the basis of neurodivergence, right? Mm -hmm. So it's looking at neurology as a uh, identity vector like other identity vectors. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't mean that, that people cannot be disabled within that context. People mm -hmm. absolutely can and can require supports for, for those things. But um, we're not looking to cure ADHD or autism or dyslexia. It's how do we support and have community with um, people who have lots of intersecting identities and how can we help them feel comfortable and um, interact however they wish to interact within the environment. And sometimes there is a desire to not have too much stimulus and that's trying to train somebody out of their hyperacusis, for example, by making them listen to things <laughs> to get them Right? Like that, that is a thing people do still, you know, when you can hear the electricity in the walls and somebody's blasting music in your ear to try to desensitize you to it. I consider that a form of torture personally. Yeah. Um, let's go to co-regulation because I feel like this is inevitably, this is a, is this a role, right? When and I see self-regulation and co-regulation to be two ends of a spectrum that we that we move from developmentally, like I, like in my mind, in my simple mind, this is how I see where when we where we have to be co-regulated as little ones um, and as adults too, right? And learn, but learn how to be more self-regulating, right? Um, if we see that, that means that. The times where we need co-regulation, our co-regulator must mm -hmm. help us productively in, the, in those moments. And so, right. you know, what is a co-regulator, one? Um, and, um, well, let's start there. Like, how would, how would you define what a co-regulator is? Well, I tend to like kind of broad definitions of things. So there's a lot of wiggle room within them. Um, for those kinds of terms anyway. So a co-regulator would literally be any, any individual or environment that is interacting with that person that serves to help them stay within some range of comfort, right? Where, um, you know, it's like, you know, this porridge is too hot and this one's too cold and, how, you know, Everybody has their porridge temperature that they like, right? So um, it needs to be very situational and very contextualized because um, a person's need for assistance in, in regulation can be very different across settings, at different times of day, with different people. Um, and so what I see a lot clinically is... Um, let's say parents insisting that a child is one way with them and another way with the other one. And one's good and the other's bad. And instead of thinking about 
you know, ev- the, the, this isn't a, a blank slate situation, right? So I have my own, if I'm interacting with somebody, right? And I'm going to see what I can do to help their regulation. I have to keep in mind mine. So one of the things about taking this sort of broader view also means that it's a relational way of viewing things as opposed to I'm going to fix you broken person. Mm -hmm. Because then the the assumption is, I guess, that the co-regulator is not broken in any way, I guess, if you're going to go with that language, you know, and but the, to me, that's part of this sort of normative bias. What I mean, again, I'm like, what's normal? I don't even, what is, what is that? And so to, to make everything more contextualized and relationship-based also means moving away from that very, you know, late capitalist individualism approach that is, can be so alienating for people. hmm you know, so that's my view on co-regulation broadly. Mm-hmm. Laura, you want to add? No, I was basically th- thinking the same thing in terms of the adult, you know, think or, or thinking about a caretaker or parent or teacher. A therapist. A therapist. <laughs> but they have to, they have to be, they have to, uh, be regulated themselves. And I think a lot of times too, it's, it's harder for that person to look at themselves. Uh, and it, instead it's the idea that the other person needs to be fixed. Right. Uh, and if the other person's fixed and everything's fine, no, I'm just upset because of how they're doing, (laughs) what they're doing. (laughs) It's like, well, you're you're a jerk is not a feeling. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I feel like you're a jerk. (laughs) Yeah. No, um, you know, co-regulation, it, I'm going to add another layer to this because not only do you need to know yourself, if you are co-regulating someone, there is the assumption that you have more mastery and skill. That's a, you, you, know, right? what assume, no. you know what assuming does. No, do you, yeah. but do you know what I'm saying though? Like if you're the yeah. adult, if you're the, sir, if you're the teacher, right. if you're the therapist, if you, whoever you are, if you're in the position of supporting someone else. Not only do you need to know your own regulation, arousal, distress, stress responses, okay? Yeah. Um, you also have to be more of a self-regulator, a better one than the person you're supporting because you inevitably are anchoring this other person. You're meeting them where that other person, you're meeting the other person where they are in order to adjust the level of comfort, accessibility in their environment, et cetera. The other layer of that though, is do you also understand the profile, the arousal profile, the sensory motor profile of the person you're supporting? Or of yourself. You know, yeah. Part of right. this is but, the implicit oh. bias issue, right? Yeah. Because you can't, you know, I always use this as an example. Does a fish know it's in water? And so that's why relational work is so important because it's very hard for any of us to see our own implicit biases, our own areas of privilege. And the way we understand those generally is by relating to other people and learning through that. And for some people, that can be a very challenging experience because it can feel like being made aware of, of areas of privilege is an attack. Mm-hmm. And then, you, you know, you get defensiveness and yada, yada, yada. So it's, it actually is a trickier thing. I mean, when you're talking about developing co-regulation, it's, it's a lot easier said than done in my experience. Very much so. Uh, and I clinically, well, I see that. And I think, it, it, you know, it's also the the person, the co-regulator has a model in mind mm-hmm. for how the other person should be behaving or what should be happening in this situation rather than putting that model aside and just being with what is happening, like being with, we don't do a lot of being with other humans. 
we do a lot of like resisting what they're doing or trying to cling to what they're doing, but we don't just be with them to be able to see what is needed in that moment, as opposed to what's really needed in that moment, as opposed to what I think is needed in that moment. It's kind of like, um, right. I think about when I was in art school uh, many years ago and I took a, uh, I had a life drawing class that would last for six hours. And I had this amazing instructor, but he, he would always say, don't draw what you think you see, draw what you actually see. And I was like, what, are, what, what does that mean? <laughs> what are you talking about? And then one day, uh, halfway through class, so three hours in, all of a sudden, I wasn't seeing, I was looking at the life model and I wasn't seeing an arm and I wasn't seeing, so I wasn't seeing a model, a, a label, a category or a model of what I thought I should be seeing. I just saw shapes and I actually saw, that was the best drawing I ever did. And I saw things in a very different way. So I wasn't seeing them through the model of my mind through a label, through a category, through what I thought this I should. This is what be. a hand is supposed to look like. Yeah. So it was like kind of putting that aside and being able to, to really see. And I just, I feel like that we don't do enough of that um, when we're with others. We're too busy trying to get them to, as we're watching them going, well, actually I need their behavior to be X, Y, Z because I need to get this other thing done or whatever it is. So that also, I mean, that really, that coupled with everything else that that Deb was saying, it, it makes it very hard to be good co-regulators because we actually can't just push our stuff, all of our stuff aside and and just be to yeah. with them to to really observe and see, well, what do they really need here? Yeah. What's really happening? Well, and especially when people um, when, when you've got children who struggle with dysregulation, right? Because there's, you know, within a fight, flight, freeze, fawn within that neurological framework, the, the fighters or the, the people who have meltdowns that get called tantrums, right, are always the ones that get the attention about, oh my, how do we stop this person doing X, Y, or Z, right? And it becomes a behavior management issue as opposed to a what is causing such distress and how do we remove whatever it is that's causing the distress so that they feel better and are less distressed as opposed to what kind of, um, you know, ignoring strategies should we do or, you know, because that's the nice way to do behavior management. Right. Um, and it's, I mean, I, I just think that, that what, what gets used as a means of supposedly improving somebody's executive function ends up inadvertently or sometimes on purpose training somebody um, to be compliant. And in many ways, I, I think that the current views of executive function and its development is really based on a very coercive model um, for people. Which yeah. is why this book chapter is so important. It's, it's coming out as a text in a textbook that is meant to inform and provide framework for a multitude of different types of professionals. Mm -hmm. We're going to be entering um, a space where they're going to be supporting someone. Well, right? and one of the challenges we're facing right now, I think, in the field is trying to somewhat move away from a medical model, right? That trying to, I know in my own language, I'm, I'm moving away more from diagnosis and more into identification and a need of supports. And those kinds of language changes, I think, take a long time to establish, especially, um, you know, in the insurance industry world where we're, you know, based on, you know, supports are obtained through a uh, diagnostic code of, of some sort or another being used. Yeah. Um, so that's another thing that, that is just, is a factor and, um, I think should be addressed directly when possible. And yeah. to just say, listen, you know, 
I tend to try not to view things in a pathologizing manner. However, you need insurance to cover this occupational therapy work that is a sensory motor approach and sensory, you know, informed and arousal informed, but you need that code. Yeah. And that's a, I mean, that's definitely a larger, I mean, like that's a systemic. Oh, we'll have a of, whole separate issue. Yeah. That can that be a separate thing. thing. But I mean, I, I think anyone who is, is a, if you're an educator, if you are someone that's going to OT or PT, or you are an occupational therapist, speech therapist, anyone working with uh, differently wired kinds of students, um, or you're working, you know, um, supporting development. I mean, some that's, you know, period yeah. supporting development. You know, I, I would really encourage people to check out this book and the chapter in this book because it does try to disrupt the way in which we we um, understand people's behaviors or their motivations. And it expands our way of being able to understand that. So it's not just judgment, top down, shame, try harder. You're not trying hard enough. You know, you're lazy, unmotivated. Like, let's you like, need really executive function training. Yeah, only ninety nine yeah. ninety nine per month. Yeah, right, right, yeah. exactly. Get my computer based exactly. program. Yeah, yeah. Teach you yeah. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, both Deb, Laura. Thank you so much for coming on and just kind of oh, talking about and having a conversation about your chapter. I'm going to put the link of the book in the description below so that everyone can check it out. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you.